morning. I like the doors open. That way I can see the people in the fellowship hall, what they're saying and doing. And just give them an eyeball, see if they're, you know, if they're really paying attention to the sermon or, or if they're just eating and talking. and You know what I mean? Just kind of eyeball them. And, not, and no judgment. Well, then maybe there is a little bit, but I'm just saying. We'll see how attentive they are. Give me the five points of the sermon. You only had three. I want five. All right, please stand with me. Let's read this little portion of Scripture together. We are finishing up Romans chapter 3. Getting in verse, and, and if you're in the sermon, you can stand in the fellowship hall as well. Romans three twenty seven through 31. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us now through your spirit and empower us to apply your truth to our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, this morning as we finish it up, chapter 3, remember we have transitioned over from the first part into the second part of the book of Romans. We've gone from uh, the wrath of God into the grace of God. And last week we spoke about that grace a little bit. And here we continue that, and I've entitled this portion of Scripture, By Faith. Romans three twenty seven through 31, By Faith. And you often hear that, maybe that term that we are to walk by faith. And you may not quite understand, well, what exactly does that mean, to walk by faith? And, and I hope to explain that a little bit, to give you some understanding so that you can apply it in your lives, because I think a lot of people believe in God, and, and they'll read the scriptures, and, and they'll believe in it, but they don't understand that to walk by faith implies not just believing it, but actually taking action on what you believe. Uh, now, you may, we may ask, well, what is faith? Well, biblical faith, the Bible tells us what it is. So we don't have to guess. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And someone said, Essentially, faith is trusting in something that you cannot explicitly prove. You trust in it, but what does it mean to trust in it? Well, biblical faith has two aspects to it. Okay? One, intellectual assent. And two, trust. And so just believing in it is not enough. Because scripture tells us in James that what the demons believe, that there is a God. So when you have faith, it doesn't mean that you just believe it. But the second aspect is that to actually rely on something, it is trust. And a practical application would be you came in the sanctuary this morning you, you, and even though you have done this maybe out of habit up to now, you looked at the chair that you're going to sit in, and, and you made a decision. You, you believed that that chair could hold you. Amen? But you had faith in, to trust it, so what did you do? You sat in the chair. You see, it, it took some action. You just didn't look at the chair and say, I believe. I have faith that chair can, can, can hold me. No, you see, biblical faith then takes action. You sat down in the chair believing that it can hold you. And so that biblical faith then applies to every single aspect of our relationship with Christ. It doesn't mean just believe. It means you need to trust as well. So when you walk by faith, you, you take, action on what you believe in you trust 
and, and you do something about it. And we'll learn that as we go through these, uh, these few scriptures. But by faith, first, uh, we'll speak on boasting is excluded by faith. Secondly, that we are justified by faith. That's verses 20 through 30. And finally, the last verse, the law is upheld by faith. Uh, and so trust is, is sitting down in the chair, so to speak. Sitting down in the chair. Let, let's first look at boasting excluded by faith. Now, what Paul is saying here, and speaking mainly to the Jews or to the religious person, but applicationally certain, certainly applies to all of us. Right? He says then, in verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? What becomes of our boasting? And boasting means you, you've done something, and you're saying, look what I've done. Okay? And whatever it happens to be. And, and we all do that to a certain extent. If you have a Facebook account, you'll post pictures, right? You know, look, look what I did, or, or look what I've done. You've, you've, uh, you put your diploma on the wall. Look what I did. You know, you, it, it's one thing after another. We, we've done this thing. I've accomplished this. Look at, you know, you, you work on your garden. Oh, look what I've done. Or, or you know, it's one thing after another. You've done this. And what Paul is saying, you can never post a picture about what you've done when it comes to your salvation. Because you've done nothing. Because you, you, you can't work for your salvation. And so you can't never say about your relationship in Christ, oh, look what I've done. I'm holy, I'm, I'm righteous, I'm walking with Jesus, and you're not, and, 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 you know, and, and all this other stuff, and you can never do that. Because boasting is excluded. Um, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul wrote, who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And, you know, he, he likes to ask questions, right? 80, how many questions in, in Romans? 85, thank you. You should know this. 85 questions in Romans. And I don't know how many in 1 Corinthians, but apparently a bunch of them. Here are a couple of them. Who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? There's two, three. But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? In other words, everything you have has been given to you. And you may say, well, I've worked for it. God gave you the, the body to work for it. He gave you the mind to work for it. He gave you the strength to work for it. Uh, he gives you the very next breath that you breathe. You could easily take it away at any moment in time. And so we, we, we can't boast about anything. Uh, if we're to boast about anything, 1 Corinthians one thirty one says, just as it is written, written in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, let him boast, boast in the Lord. We boast in Jesus. And so what Paul is saying here is that uh, you cannot boast that you've earned your salvation. It doesn't work like that. Uh, an example would be when a swimmer is saved from drowning, all right, he, he doesn't boast that I trusted in that lifeguard and it was because of my trust that I got saved. You see? Yeah, no, you, you, were, you were drowning. You were, you were, it wasn't your trust or your faith in that lifeguard that saved you. It was the position you were in. Somebody came and saved you. And the same thing in our relationship with Christ. We were drowning. And a lot of people come to Christ when they are what? Desperate. In fact, I would say everybody comes to Christ when they are desperate. Until you are desperate and understand that you're a sinner who needs to be saved, you won't come. Because you, you are so prideful thinking that you don't need Jesus. And that's what Paul has been trying to explain in the first three chapters, that, that men, humankind, desperately needs Jesus Christ. That you have nothing that, that, that could possibly contribute to your salvation. So it's, it's a call for humility then. 
the call for humility. We we need to be humble. We've been saved by grace through faith and not by works. Um, lest anyone could boast, right? In the second part, he goes, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Now, whenever you, you look up the, the word law, you, you may say, well, you know, what is law? A bunch of rules and regulations. And, and Paul uses that word in different ways, and that's why you have to understand that context is always important to understand the way he's using that particular word. Sometimes he'll, he'll, when speaking of the law, he's speaking about the Old Testament, right? The first five books, the, the Pentateuch, or even the, the entirety of the Old Testament. And sometimes he's speaking of law as, as in a sense of using it as a principle. And that's more or less what he's saying here. By, by what kind of law? By a law of works? And he goes, no, it, it's by a law of faith. As if there, there's this principle of faith that, that that's what results when we are saved. So it, it's not by, by works. And, and the word there for works, ergon, and, and uh, you know, just speaking about works, we, we've been created for works, the Bible says, right? In Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, 8 to 10, for, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves and not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we've been created for good works uh, so that we can, reveal who we are, in a sense, in Christ Jesus. But those works don't save us. We're, we're not saved by works, but we are created for works. Did you know that the, one of the first things that God gave to Adam and Eve was what? Work. And people say, I don't like work. You've been created to work. That's the reality of it. And, and, you know, some of the works that you do, you may not actually get paid for it. You're paid in other ways. You know, some will say, well, well, you know, a housewife doesn't work. Oh, they work. They work. Somebody's got to take care of those kids, right? Somebody has to train them up in, in righteousness. And, and there's work. I tell you, the more kids you have, the more work you have. Right, And so everybody has work to do in a sense. Now, if all you're doing is sleeping all day and watching TV, well, no, you're not working. You're not working. We're not called to do that. No, no one is. We're called to, to do something, to, to work something. Uh, but those works don't earn our way to heaven. We can never, you've been told, we, we can never do enough good things to get to heaven. Well, how do we get there? We get there by, by faith, by this law of faith or this principle of faith, this principle of, of believing in Jesus Christ and of trusting him and then of living in such a way that it displays your trust in him. Okay, not just believing, right? Because we talked about even the demons believe, but by then putting that belief into action so that now you're living by faith. Uh, when I first got saved, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And, and you know, there's something that I, I had the stereotype of Christians. Christians don't cuss and they don't drink. I've come to understand that, unfortunately, some do. And some of you are balling each other because, you know, you, you've been soaking up the suds. You're, you're a, you're a, uh, I, I, I yeah, I, I know. I, I saw you guys look at each other. You've been soaking up the suds. You got your glass. Give me a bottle. Yeah, got your bottle. Oh, Jesus drank wine. And, you know, and all this other stuff, right? You know, and there you are. And, and, and you know, well, well, it was the monks who invented beer. And so, you know, it's, it's holy beer and, and so on and so forth. But, hey, whatever. I, I just believe Christians don't cuss. They don't drink. So guess what? I acted on it. I not only believed it, I acted on it. I, I took my, uh, my, my belief and I turned it into trust so that I stopped cussing. I stopped drinking. 
you, you, it becomes a principle to you. You no longer do it. And so when you read Scripture and it tells you, you know, to, to do something, then you act on that belief. You need to put your faith, your, your belief into action in order for it to become faith. Otherwise, you're just believing. And we, we miss it so often. We believe it when we read it, but we don't trust it enough to act on it. Right? And that's true. And that's, and that's what, you know, when we just, when we start to do those things again, we're not trusting. We're not trusting. And, and it's applicable to every single part of our lives. And so, so we can't boast, getting, getting back to this point here, uh, John MacArthur said, the greatest lie in the world is the lie common to all false religions and cults, that by certain works of their own doing, men are able to make themselves acceptable to God. The greatest error is that, is that belief is its sheer impossibility. Impossibility. The greatest evil is that it robs God of what? His glory. Whenever you try to add works to salvation, you're robbing God of his glory and you're taken away from what Jesus did on the cross. And to put it applicationally, when, when it comes to Roman Catholicism, that's their greatest sin. Now they, they, you know, they believe Jesus died on the cross and everything, but they try to add to it. And so now what happens is you're, you're taken away from what Jesus did on the cross. What he did wasn't enough. And so you've got to add your own works and, and you're then you're nullifying what he did on the cross. And you're downgrading what Jesus Christ did. No, the, the sufficiency is the cross. What he accomplished there. So boasting is excluded by faith. Uh, secondly, we are justified by faith. For we hold that one is justified apart from works of the law. Justified, in other words, declared righteous or made righteous. And we know that justification is like, uh, there's two parts to it. There, there's the positional justification, and then there's the practical one, right? Positionally, when, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been justified, declared righteous, made right with God. So now you and God are not enemies. You're, you're buddy, buddy. Well, you should be. But practically is that work that God begins to do in your life. How he begins to mold you and shape you into the image and person of, of Jesus Christ. That's practical righteousness. And, that, and that's a work that he began when he saves you and that he will continue until you go home to Jesus. And so we hold that one is justified. Hold is the word uh, and and it means the idea of You've come to, you've looked at all the facts and you've come to a conclusion. And you said, there it is. I've looked at everything. I've looked at myself. I looked at everything. And, and Paul said, I, I looked at how bad I was and, and how much I needed Jesus. And I've come to the conclusion that man, that, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. But notice that second word in the verse, for we. Who's he talking about? He's not just talking about himself, right? For we hold. And, and he's, maybe it's leaders of the church, maybe it's Christians in general. He doesn't identify who we is, but I would say anyone who understands that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, that's who, that's who the we incorporates. For we hold that one is justified by faith. By faith. So you give your life to Jesus Christ, right? You, you believe, I believe he died on the cross, but in order for faith to be totally enacted, what do you have to do now? You have to begin to live it. And a lot of people just, just believe, you know, I, I just have to believe. And they don't make the transition from believing to trusting. And so what happens is they... 
they then uh, struggle with their belief because they, they can't make that transition. And they struggle with it where they're like, well, you know, I believe, but. No, you give your life to Jesus Christ, you believe it, and then you begin to live it. This is now who I am. I, I, I've, I've died with Christ. I'm no longer my my own. I he bought me with the price. Therefore, if any man is a new creation, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old man has what? Died. Died. And, and you have to actually not only believe that, but you have to live it for it to become real in your life. You have to say, the old man is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. And that's walking by faith then. The old man is dead. I'm totally different. I'm a new creation in Christ. And now I begin by walk by faith that truth in my life. You've been justified by faith. A uh, couple of verses here just declaring what Jesus will continue to do in Philippians 1 6. And he said, I'm sure this Paul said that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That that work of practical justification, he'll continue to work in you. And then we see how he goes from one work to another in Romans 8, 29 to 30. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. He also glorified. I'm a new creation. And, and then your heart should be flooded with peace and with joy because of what Christ has done for you. And all this is done, what, apart from works of the law. Apart from works of the law. Totally apart from it. Some would say, well, what about the book of James? Because James talks a lot about works, doesn't he? And I'm going to read you some verses from James. James chapter 2, 14 to 26, it reads, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is pu poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So what James is saying, you, you say you believe, but have you acted on that belief? You say you believe, but, but have you taken action on that belief? Otherwise, you're, you're still like, like, you know, the demons believe, right? But ha have you taken action on that belief? But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Yeah, they believe in God. They believe that God. there's only one God, but they never acted on that belief. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works and was faith was completed by his works. And so Abraham not only believed, but he, he trusted enough so that he took what action? He trusted until his, his, his faith was completed then. And it wasn't that his action saved him, but that his action revealed that what he believed was true. He ultimately believed it. it, it you look at, at the apostles after Jesus died. And the early church was, was begun 
And, and there they were. They, they believed what? Well, they believed that Jesus died on the cross and that he was resurrected until they began to tell others about him. And, and then all of a sudden, people are mad and they want to kill him. But they believed that they continued to tell others in spite of the persecution that could occur. Some of them end up dying for their faith. You see, they, they took their belief into action. And they continued to, to trust then. Abraham believed God, he was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? There's the body. Apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And so the character of true faith is that it will be revealed. It will be revealed. There'll be a change in that person's life who has truly been born again. It'll be revealed. And, you know, and, that, and that's one of the things that... Um, Christianity struggles with is, you know, people come up and, and they receive salvation. They, you know, they, we do an altar call and they come up, they receive Jesus, and then, you know, they, their, their life hasn't changed, right? And people, you know, will ask, well, are they saved? I don't know. I mean, they, they raised their hand, they came up, they said, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but did they... Are they now living by faith in that they've put that belief into action? And unfortunately, sometimes the, the way we promote it is that, you know, people think, well, if I just do that, that's all I need to do. If you truly believed it, you would what? You see, it would change the, the way you live your life. You, you believed you could sit in that chair. And so what did you do? You sat. In that chair. That's trust. It's changed. Jesus should have changed your life. And, and he'll do that. He'll change your, your life. And, and it's not that you work for your salvation. But in a sense you what? You work out your salvation. You work out your salvation. Scripture tells us that as well. So, so true faith alone saves. But true faith. Saving faith has the character of evidence then behind it. We all know salvation is a gift. It's not a paycheck. Right? You're not, you know, salvation isn't paying you for what you've done. It's never a paycheck, but it's, it's, it's just a gift. But then what, what good is the law? And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. In one sense, God gave us, uh, he never gave us the law to be a ladder and that we try to climb up it and reach him. The law is an x-ray machine. It takes an x-ray of who you are and, you know, there you are and, and you're looking at the x-ray and, oh gosh, you know, messed up. Messed up beyond belief. You know, it's like the doctor looking, and he showed me my knee. He goes, oh, how bad is it? Well, between good and bad, it's very bad, he said. I'm like, you didn't even mention very bad. No, I know, but between good and bad, it's very bad. So it's on the other side. Of, Have you seen the x-ray? No, let me show it to you. I go, oh, no wonder. Yeah. Galatians 2, 16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, since by works of the law no flesh will be justified. There's a man by the name of Ebenezer Wooten preaching one time in, in England in, in, the, in, the, in the square there. I guess they call them squares in England, you know. Every we we uh, we call them what plazas, right? Plazas here in 
in the southwest, I, I think in plazas. We call them squares in England. They're squares, but they're plazas as well. And so he's preaching, and, and the crowd is dispersing, and he's loading up equipment, and a young man approached him and said, Mr. Wooten, what must I do to be saved? Mr. Wooten said, you're too late. You're too late. And, you know, he's thinking, oh, I missed the service, right? I'm too late. And Mr. Wooten said, you're too late. You can't do anything. It's already been done. It was accomplished on the cross. The work of salvation is done. It's complete. It's finished. It's been paid in full. John 19.30, you simply need to believe and you need to trust. You need to now walk by faith. Walk by faith, believing and trusting that, that and, and, you know, and that applies to every single aspect. As I mentioned before, uh, one thing, we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? And people say, well, how do you get baptized? And what do I need to do? You need, a, you need a belief. You need to have faith. That what will happen is what is going to happen. Well, does anything happen? Like, you know, do I, am I, the way I feel, is it different? The, the, the way, you know, is it, does, do I start speaking tongues? Do, do I, what, what happened? You, you believe. And then you, Trust that you've received it. And so what do you do? And then all of a sudden you start telling others about Jesus. You see? You believe and you trust. I got the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Now I can live as a Christian because I have the power of the Holy You believe it and you, when, when you start believing and in, in putting it into action, then you're trusting that what he said is true. A Roman Paul then speaks about, is anyone excluded here? He said, or is God the God of the Jews only? Of Jews only, is he not the God of Gentiles also? And he answers his own question, yes, of Gentiles also. Because part of the problem there in the early church was that uh, when people come to Christ, the Jews said, wait a sec. You first have to become what? Jewish. Before you can become a Christian. That's how we did it. We, we were circumcised. You need to be circumcised. You need, a, you need to become a Jew. Then you can become a Christian. There's a lot. You know the Judaizers were all over the place. Trying to, to push that truth. And so Paul wrote to the Galatians. Because the Galatians has fallen prey to that. They have been born again. And received Jesus. And then here come the Judaizers. Telling them. No, no, no. You first need. Oh, okay. We missed a step. And Paul said, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You know, you believe in a different gospel now. No, you, you don't have to be circumcised. Both Jew and Greek are saved by or through faith. The God is, is the God not just of the Jews, but of the Greeks. And I'll tell you another thing. Very important in our culture. God's not just the God of the Republicans. But even of the Democrats. Can you believe that? He even loves the Democrats. I know for some of us, kind of, I can't believe that. Really? He even loves, you mean Pelosi? He even I tell you, his love is incredible. It stretches beyond modern comprehension. He even died for, uh, for those people who believe in Islam. He even died for them and wants them to come to salvation. Right? And, and you know, in, in our politically uh, stressed climate that we live in. You know, sometimes we think, well, if you're a Christian, you you got to be a Republican. No, there are some believers that, that aren't. Uh, I know 
Sheila, being a social worker, says she's the only conservative social worker in the state of Texas. But uh, and, and there aren't very many. A lot of her friends are social workers and believers and staunch liberals. I mean, it's crazy, but they are. And she has to deal with their 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 policies and, and their beliefs, so to speak. But but they trust in Jesus for their salvation. And so the Jews, you know, they had the idea, well, Jesus died for, for us. Oh, no, for everybody, bro. Not just for you, but we are the chosen, right? We have the oracles of God. We, you know, we have the circumcision. We have all this. He died for everybody. In fact, Paul said in Acts 9.15 that he was a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Remember what he said earlier in Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. Galatians 3.14. In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Ephesians 3.6. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In fact, in Psalm 67, 1 and 2. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known on the earth the salvation among all nations. Nations there. The word could be translated nations, could be translated Gentiles, could be translated heathen. Among everybody. And so it's open to all. And Paul continues in verse 3, Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. How are the Jews saved? By faith. How are the Gentiles saved? By or through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves and not of works, lest anyone should boast. So faith then is, is the principle or the law by which we are saved. That's how, that's how we're saved. And so you, you believe that Jesus died on the cross, you you raised up your hand, and now you, you believe in such a way that you trust him now for that salvation. And you begin to, to live it now. I'm a new creation in Christ. So boasting is excluded by faith. You're justified by faith. And the law upheld by faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? What happens to the law then? And now when he's talking about law, he's talking about really the, the Old Testament here. First five books of the Bible. The, you know, is, is, do we just toss it away? Do we denigrate the law? Is Paul an a antinomianist? I mean, is he against the law? Because there are some believers, unfortunately, who, who take the, the wrong idea here, right? They'll say, well, the law doesn't justify me. I'm saved by grace, so I don't have to obey the law. You say, oh, no, I never said that. I never said that. I, I've only said that, you know, obeying the law doesn't get you to heaven and never will. But it doesn't mean you don't that you don't need to continue to, to follow the principles of, of Christianity. Do we then overthrow? Overthrow means to make ineffective. It's like, do we unplug the law? It has no power, right? Oh, no. You don't unplug it. Salvation is by grace through faith, but it doesn't denigrate the law. And continues, by no means, on the contrary, we what? We uphold the law. We uphold the law. 
I still remember a friend of mine telling me, I forget the name of the cult that he was involved in. Um, it might have been called the way, I think. And I've told you about them before where, where, where they, you know, it sort of had some Gnostic belief that the the you know the the body really doesn't matter what you do in the body because the body is corrupt and evil and so it's just going to be corrupt and evil. So it doesn't matter what you do. So you can sleep with whoever you want to because that's the body. All right, it's not your spirit. Your spirit is something different. But the body can do it, and people, you know. And he goes, that's the way they would draw people into the cult. Hey, you want to sleep with such and such? Have at it, bro. And there'd be guys there, you know, yeah. Man, this Christian stuff is pretty cool. No, that it's it's crazy. That's that's not what Paul is saying here. And we say, no, we we uphold the law. I'm not an antinomianist. What was the law given? Remember, it's an x-ray. The law tells us that we desperately need Jesus. And as you try to fulfill the law, you find out, man, it's hard. Isn't it? And some people say, you know, it's hard to be a Christian. And like I've told you before, it's, it's, it's uh, simple, but it's not easy. Simple part, all you got to do is read the book and and do what it says. But like putting together an Ikea wardrobe that you've never done before. The instruct, they don't even need words. The instructions are all in pictures, right? That way it doesn't matter where you send it to. Chinese dude and an American Mexican dude can do it, you know? doesn't matter who gets it because it's pictures. You just got to interpret the picture. Oh, look at the little ledge. Oh, that's what happened. You flip the board all around, bro. It doesn't say you're a bonehead, but look at the picture. Is that how I told you to do it? You know, in Christianity, it's simple. It just read the book. But it's not easy to do what it says, right? And so when, when you walk by faith and and God is telling you to forgive that person. You not only have to believe that you forgive them, but now you need to act in such a way that you have forgiven them. You see? That's walking by faith. So you, you say, you know, I forgive you. And then, you know, you, you don't ever talk to them or say anything to them or... Or say, I still remember what you've done. You know, I did. well, you haven't really forgiven them. You, you, you're still holding on to it. Right? Or, or how about worry? That's a big one, right? Because everybody struggles with worry. You worry about, about, about everything, don't you? You worry about work. You worry about your kids. You worry about yourself. You worry, I got a pain in my head. You know, there you are, worry, worry, worry. And what does Scripture say? Don't worry. Pray. You go, I do. But you still still don't make that transition from, from believing to trusting. And then what will happen? Then you start to think about other stuff, those things which are worthy and, and good and upright, as it says there in, in Philippians, right? I mean, what's, what's the, the admonition? Don't worry about anything. Right? But by prayer and, and supplication, you... you, you you give it to Jesus, but and you know we 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 believe I believe that this scripture is true, but we don't trust it enough to put it into action to where we stop worrying. And so, do we really believe that it's true? I believe that chair will hold me, but I'm not going to sit down in that chair. 
You see? And that's where walking by faith comes into. Now I'm going to leave it in his hands. I believe he's taking care of it. And now I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk by faith. And I'm not going to be consumed by worry or fear or... Because I, I tell you, a thousand things could happen, you know? A thousand things could happen. And if you start to think of all the bad things to happen, like, like you know, oh, well, I, I can't go to Mexico because, you know, the federales might stop me. And then they'll look up my birth certificate and they'll say, well, you don't have one. You're probably Mexicano. You can't come back in the U.S. of A. You're like, oh. Or they might, they might try to take my car. Or they might, or they might shoot me. Or they might, like, you're that important. Or, or, you know, just one thing after another. They don't even know who you are, brother. Yeah, bad things could happen. I, don't, I would say don't walk out the front door of the church. Somebody might run over you in the parking lot, you know. You know what I mean? It could happen. Oh, absolutely. Could. A lot of people have died in the parking lots. We know that. Don't turn on the electricity. People have been killed by electricity. Right? They have. One guy was electrocuted not too long ago. Trimming some trees, remember? Here in San Antonio. And just to let you know, that's what electrocution means. It means death by electrical shock. So when people tell me I've been electrocuted, I'm like, no, you haven't. You've been shocked. Unless you were clinically dead and then brought back to life by a miracle of God. But no, you've been shocked. You haven't been electrocuted. Electrocuted means you've been, you were dead. That guy was electrocuted. That, that shocked him. So we take the promises of God, we believe them, and we we apply them. And so when we walk by faith, we trust that they are true. Same thing with your salvation. Are you saved? Yes. I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I trust that his, his word is true. Because I'm a new creation, so I'm going to begin to live it out. Live it out. And we all know we can't live it out for somebody else. They have to come to that conclusion on their own. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And, and we're so grateful that we uh, simply have to believe and trust in you. Lord, I pray we would put that trust into, or that belief into action um, by what we do and say, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we're, we're able to accomplish what you have asked of us, Lord. Not through our strength, but through yours. So draw each of us closer to you. And, and I pray if there's anyone here who has not given their life to Christ, doesn't understand that, that you would bring them to yourself even now. Give each of us saving faith, Lord to trust you for all of our needs. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name.